Okay, I hope that's enough time. Uh, first of all, thanks very much to Melissa and Amanda and all the wonderful staff at Seabird. We've been really privileged to work with them and a number of local groups in our local Eugene Concussion Management team and been really impressed by how effective the multidisciplinary approach is and just how much it makes just selfishly our lives as physical therapists easier. And of course, great outcomes for some people who are really in need following a concussion. Um, so just to reintroduce myself, my name is Kenji Karp. I'm a physical therapist. Um, I started out as an athletic trainer and then went into physical therapy. My credentials of uh, OCS being orthopedic certified specialist, that's our physical therapy version of board certified. And then I'm now what they call an advanced competency certified vestibular therapist. Um, and that's sort of the story of why those backgrounds of my profession wind up being the areas that we can really help people after a concussion with a specialized type of physical therapy. So we're gonna to talk today a little about what we do as therapists, the approach, a little bit about the physiology of how that relates to what our patients with concussion are suffering and how we help them get back and get those functional uh, goals they need to get their life back going. Um, first thing right off the bat, we're all trying to be really good evidence-based practitioners. And so it's just nice to know this is an area where there's a lot of good recent uh, and a history of good outcomes, so good results if we apply physical therapy, particularly from the vestibular and the uh, cervical manual area of our practice, we get good results. So going back to 2010, Alishin published in the Journal of Neurophysiology. A little bit historically, it just means that we have had these kind of therapies to help people have vertigo or imbalance issues where the brain is involved for quite some time. Uh, when concussion became uh, coming into the forefront, there wasn't research that time, but we were getting referrals for people to get dizziness and balance. This study, Alishin just proved like, well, if we, if we apply the same protocols, how are we doing? Yeah, we get a good result. If we move forward to 2012, Letty is able to say, well, we really have even more background for that. Probably the biggest piece of evidence recently in our field is the Schneider study. And you're gonna hear the term cervicovestibular. Not that we need another catchphrase, but it really shows well, that's what we do for this population. We're applying our manual therapy and exercise techniques that physical therapy has always been a little more known for to help with neck pain and headaches, but we're also applying vestibular therapy, and we'll get into explaining what that means in a little bit. But if we apply both those things to somebody that has concussion, we get a really good result. So for example, for athletes that we're able to success with at eight weeks, maybe a little bit after uh, starting therapy, if they do this type of therapy, they're 78% more likely to be back to their sport than if we don't enter. So good, good results with this. Grabowski, the other term you might hear is multimodal. It just means same thing. Not quite as great of a study as the Schneider article because they went back retrograde. But the nice thing is if anybody, a school district, an educator, a doctor, these days a lot, we have to justify our plan of care with the, the, the patients, with the children's. Uh, insurance companies, we can really say, hey, this really works. So what kind of patients do we see after concussion for physical therapy? Um, it would really be based off their symptom cluster. So if they have vertigo, if they have visual motion sensitivity, and again, we'll explain what those mean in a little more detail in a second, nausea or imbalance, we're going to apply the things from the vestibular rehabilitation therapy evidence. If they've got neck pain, cervicogenic and tension headaches, so again, the idea being if you have a blow to the head and that force to cause a concussion, it's very easy to see how you can also strain the neck muscles, ligaments, and also set some of those joints off. So we apply manual therapy. That just means hands-on treatments, like if you did manual labor. And we teach the, the patient how to stabilize and get correct posture back. And then the last part, if somebody's not tolerating exertion, as a little side note that's on a lot of the literature and it always confuses people, all that means is over in Canada, the UK, Australia, they would call what we call aerobic exercise, they would just call physical exertion. So if you hear exertion or exertional exercise, all that means is just training for that. That's been shown to help athletes get back and get ready to get back to their field of play. But it's also really helpful for these kids that take a little bit longer, they're getting poorer outcomes and need more of our help. The exertional or also known as aerobic training has proved really helpful to help them have another tool to manage anxiety. Um, so to understand some of what goes on for these patients who get a concussion and why they would get things like vertigo or dizziness or nausea, 
we have to talk about just a little bit of physiology. And so the term you there, and it's one that actually really comes from education uh, and that background that we essentially have just appropriated in physical therapy is sensory integration. And what that means is your brain is constantly streaming your senses to tell you about the environment, but it's not just bringing them in, it's comparing one against the other to see if they match up. And there's a nice quote that I like from Dr. Ayers, who was an occupational therapist, also a PhD researcher. When the flow of sensation is disorganized, it could be life could be like a rush hour traffic jam. Things just don't make sense. So as you're sitting here watching this webinar, when you think about it, you just take it for granted that you know you're sitting in your chair or standing, but that you're stationary, or if you were in fact moving, that you are moving. The reason you can take that for granted is your brain is doing an outstanding job of integrating sense from your vision. So if you look at your computer screen, you can see, oh, I'm not moving in relation to that. You could also feel that. So I've got the logo there of the pressure from the feet that we use quite a bit more standing. Right now, if we're sitting in our chairs, listening to the webinar, you're not aware of it consciously, but you can feel pressure, say, from your backside or your back or legs on the chair. That also tells you they're stationary. And then that funny graphic in the upper right is the vestibular apparatus of the inner ear, and it senses not only hearing uh, for the cochlea, but it senses head movement or position. A good way to think of that inner ear or the vestibular apparatus would be kind of like the sensors on your smartphone that let the smartphone know if you're holding it vertical, like if you wanted to display a picture what we call portrait, or if you held the phone horizontal, so if you wanted to display a picture what we call landscape. The reason your smartphone can tell where it is and change the display is it has what we call an accelerometer and a gyroscope. That's what our inner ear does first as well. Sensory integration means that our brains are comparing all three of those senses on a split second basis and making sure that they all add up together. When it works, you don't even realize it's working. But if either of those senses get damaged, or say if concussion with the part of the brain that reads those senses gets affected, if you can't compute the data, you could be tricked. You could think you're moving when you're not. And that's what this next slide shows is with the mild traumatic brain injury, it is a brain injury, thankfully not leading to permanent changes, but it can lead to very extensive temporary debilitating conditions. You've got a trauma to the central nervous system and particularly the parts that read the input from that inner ear. So the job of the inner ear, also known as the vestibular apparatus, is to transduce that head movement information, just like your smartphone can tell where it is, your inner ear can sense that, and it signals the brainstem. From the brainstem, that information gets passed to lots of other important structures, the cerebellum, the cortical, the upper structures of the brain, the higher thinking, along a lot of complex central nervous system pathways. There'd be no need for anyone here to try to memorize those, but just think of it as computing. Information comes in, normally without a concussion, the computer processes that flawlessly, and you just know where you are. But if there's damage to those senses, like a lot of our patients that we get in the clinic who don't have concussion might actually have physical damage to the inner ear. If there's bad input going to the computer, you're gonna get bad output. You're gonna mistakenly think you're moving. And that's why if you look at the graphic in the lower right corner, that's a vertigo. Vertigo is an abnormal sense of motion. And so if your brain is misreading the information from your inner ears, you might know that intellectually, I'm not spinning, but one of our patients with concussion might, might swear to you that they feel like they're spinning on a merry-go-round. A quick side note, for a long time, the operational definition of vertigo was a little too rigid. They would say things and focus on the vocabulary and say, well, unless a patient says that I'm spinning, it's not vertigo. Really, it's any abnormal sense of movement. So the inner ear can sense linear motion. Say, for example, if you're traveling up and down in an elevator, forward on the moving walkway at the airport or rocking up and down on a, a, a boat dock. Those are all movements that the ear can detect. So if, if it can detect it, it means a concussion, it can also misinterpret that. Some people will feel like they're drifting versus only spinning. That would be vertigo. But the cause of that is the jarring of the brain of concussion shakes it. Those brain functions are temporarily disrupted just like a lot of our patients will have great trouble with school because their cognitive function of the brain's affected. If the sensory integration functions of the brain are affected by the concussion, they're not gonna be able to process those senses well 
and they're going to have vertigo. They're going to feel like they're moving when they're not. They're going to feel dizzy, and they'll also have a lot of nausea. Because your brain uses that information to help you balance, they're also going to be off balance. So those are the symptoms we see quite often with concussion that warrant trying a vestibular approach in physical therapy. So if we know the uh, reflexes and the anatomy and physiology just a little bit more, it gives us a greater detail on a lot of the things that some of your students and patients will report with vertigo. Um, so there's a specific vestibular ocular reflex. If we break down that term, vestibular means that inner chamber of the ear that senses head movement. Ocular obviously means eye, and there's a reflex between them. This is something that we all have. It's hardwired, and it serves a really important purpose. If you think about it, your eyes are in your head. Say if you were walking or hiking down a rough trail, that's going to make your head move a little bit more, but yet you still want to see what's in front of you. This reflex lets you go ahead and stabilize your vision. So, for example, if I were going to take a step on a hiking trail, uh, I step in a gopher hole, my head drops down a little. As my head drops down, my inner detects that. My brain instantly fires a reflex to have my eyes go up so I can stay on target. This is essentially nature's steady camera device, the same way like an expensive camera, like a GoPro would give you a better image. Um, now, if that's off, the problem is that, again, if the brain with the concussion misinterprets and says, hey, I think this patient is moving their head to the left, like in the diagram we've got on the left side of the slide, it's going to do what it's always done. The brain's going to say, hey, if the head's moving left, I better move the eyes to the right. But the problem is, if that's occurring in error, if, it's, if the brain thinks you're moving left because it's having trouble processing the information from the ear and it makes the eyes go right, that's incorrect, and it shifts the image of, that the patient sees. So nystagmus would refer to a fact where with concussion and other conditions affecting the vestibular system, you can get where the eyes get drawn off target because of the misinterpretation of head position. And we can see that sometimes in therapy, we actually use some technologies to look at their eyes. So nystagmus is a phenomenon very common with concussion. The patient sometimes will be aware their eyes are literally jumping in the sockets. Sometimes they're not aware of it, but it's very common. Oscillopsia means that if the eyes are moving like that, the quality of the image they're going to get is disturbed. So the picture in the lower right section of the slide shows a nice little alleyway in the city. You'll notice as it's really jumbled because the camera was shaking when they took the picture. That picture, as disturbing as it looks, is how a lot of these kids of concussion are seeing the world or their school hallway when they're moving along. If you want to try a little demo, I know this is a webinar, but it's going to get people interactive. I wouldn't recommend the demo I got that describe if you have vertigo. If you do have vertigo, please avoid it. But if you want to try, you could look at something on the slide, say the O and ocular. Now, if you move your head side to side like you're saying no and gradually increase the speed, there'll be a speed for everybody where that O starts to jump side to side. So even for those of us who don't have a concussion, there's limits to how fast you can move the head and how much this vestibular ocular reflex can stabilize your gaze to give you a good image. What you want to think about is if you were doing the demo we described and as you moved your head to a fast speed, the O and ocular started to move on you, again, that's happening for our patients with concussion, but it could be happening at even just routine, very slow head speeds. It starts to explain how they're perceiving the world and how difficult it is while they're recovering from that concussion. So ocular motor control refers to related to what we just talked about, but it's, it's coordination of the eye movements. So if you think about your eyeball and the retina as a camera, they have to capture the light on that retina in order for your brain to be able to perceive anything visually, whether that's in sports or whether that's in academics or just walking down the halls at school. And just like we do in lots of others in therapy, that's what physical therapists are skilled at. Motor control, coordination, how your brain tells your muscles to do things. We're used to that for things like leg and arm muscles. This is the same idea we're just talking about, the, what they call the extraocular muscles. So there's six eye muscles behind each eyeball, and they, they combine in these elegant motor programs to point your eyes together at the same point in space. Smooth pursuits means that's what we would use if we were following a really slow moving target, 
continuously in real time. Saccades is the vast majority of our eye movements. Those are more rapid movements that will catch up your, your vision to say a moving target or move between two or more different targets. Uh, we do this all the time, even reading the newspaper, your eyes are making these coordinated little jumps, character to character. Vergence refers to how the eyes coordinate together to give you binocular vision, uh, to be able to judge depth perception. So for example, if you were looking out to the horizon, out to a theoretical infinity really far away, your eyes would be relatively apart. If you then go and look at your, your phone to read a text, the eyes have to come closer together to be able to get on the same target. Our brains normally do this all the time to give us really good visual perception. But then again, with concussion, if those circuits in the brain that control the eye muscles are affected, they won't be able to get the eyes on target well. That means they won't get good visual perception. That also contributes to the dizziness, vertigo, and imbalance. But it also can, particularly with depth perception, be part of why they just feel disconnected to the environment. It also makes a lot of sense that because so much learning is visual, if they can't control the movements of their eyes, this is a big reason why they have trouble with visual comprehension in school. So nystagmus, sir, you see I've got an embedded link to YouTube. I'm sorry that didn't transfer over to play automatically, but I have an example on YouTube that we'll view after these other slides. So thanks for your patience. Now, another topic is what we call visual motion sensitivity. And what that means is vertigo, like we said earlier, is an abnormal sense of movement. Uh, if somebody's brain from concussion wasn't reading that input from the inner ear that detects that head movement, they could feel like they're moving even though they know intellectually they're not. Well, it turns out sometimes that happens even with uh, when the head is still. Because your brain uses all three of those senses, your vestibular sense, your visual sense, and your touch and pressure, different visual things can provoke vertigo for people. Um, again, this is something that happens for all of us, even uninjured, but it's a lot more pronounced of concussion. So as I've been talking, a lot of you might have noticed on the right side of the slide, there's those contrasting black and white stripes, and they're just not super pleasant to look at for anybody. Um, these kind of patterns are present a lot more commonly than we think in fabrics and carpet in nature. Say if you were driving and you think about the wood supports of a guardrail on a freeway, there's a lot of things like this that have repeating contrasting patterns. That movement in the background visually tricks the eyes into moving. So it tricks it. It's another way that the eye can get tricked into nystagmus or sort of a twitching abnormal movement. And so when that's going on, it's another factor that makes it very hard for our patients of concussion to get a good visual reading and help them orient. Um, so without those visual landmarks, things get much more difficult. So this is an example, and you can say, oh yeah, on the slide, that's really bothersome. I wouldn't wanna look at that forever. Well, these patterns are a lot more present than we think. So if we look here on the left side of the slide, when I got this uh, open uh, share access image, I think the caption on some of the social media is being slided as when the devil chooses carpet patterns. Notice there's also a mirror at the base of the stairs that reflects the same pattern. So this is a carpet you could buy at Home Depot or something, but I don't even like looking at it and I don't have a concussion, but if our patients already had a concussion and they're already feeling dizziness, vertigo, nausea, they feel like they're moving even when they're sitting still. Then if we put them in front of a stairway like this, that provokes, because of a visual optical illusion, it tricks the eye into moving and further disorients them. It makes sense they would really have trouble going down those stairs. If we now transition to the upper right corner of the slide, you can see how reading a textbook for any subject, you've got a line of black text, you've got a white space in between, you've got another line of black text that repeats. So all reading, whether it's on a smart device, a desktop computer, or a good old trusty hard copy book, there's a certain degree of what they call optico-kinetic nystagmus. So if we break down that word, optico meaning visual, kinetic meaning movement, nystagmus, like we said, is an involuntary twitching movement of the eyes. That's why a lot of people say, yeah, it's not just that I'm having trouble comprehending uh, written work in school, 
but it literally made me feel sick or dizzy or nauseated. They're experiencing a normal optical illusion that we all feel. Probably all of us on the screen don't care for the carpet on the left side of the slide, but if you've had a concussion, that's even more provoking. If we look at the lower right corner of the slide, you can see how just going from class to class for some of our patients with concussion could be very provoking. So they're not black and white lines, but if we say I've got one kid in front of me, his backpack, then a space in between, then another kid, the movement of the other children down the halls, the other students, can also provoke vertigo for these kids. So those are just a little brief overview of a lot of how the areas of the brain affected by concussion that handle visual and vestibular, that's that information for the near, the areas of the brain that handle that processing, when they're affected by concussion, that's why our patients can get vertigo, nausea, they could have uh, even a very skilled athlete like a gymnast might have trouble walking down the hallway at school. If their brain is misinterpreting the senses, and they think they're moving or they have trouble locating where they really are, they might have the best muscles in the world, but they'll still be off balance and disoriented. So what do we do about that? Well, vestibular rehabilitation therapy is a specialized branch of physical therapy, and it just means we have techniques to help control these things. Vertigo, like we mentioned, visual motion sensitivity with those kind of really annoying backgrounds, imbalance and nausea. What we do is called applied sensory integration. So we just teach people how to break down those senses. We educate them about the process of what their brain normally does. And then we can start digging in and making things better. Sometimes we can even make people leave the very first session even feeling a little bit better. Two main areas we do that in would be substitution. So for example, if a lot of people with concussion are having more trouble processing that inner ear information, and if they're misprocessing it and their brain thinks they're moving, like rocking on a dock or spinning on a mirror ground, even if they're not. If they're having trouble processing vestibular information, we're gonna probably compensate and uptrain their somatosensation perception, their touch and pressure, and their visual perception. Gaze stabilization means that we talked about that reflex that's there, but, and it normally helps you keep your eyes focused on a target if you were moving. Say for example, like a snowboarder tumbling through the air at the Olympics. If that's temporarily off from concussion, we can retrain the speed of that. We can tell the brain to wake up and start firing those circuits of the neurons faster. Habituation is a really difficult topic for patients, but it's a very normal process for all parts of not just motor, but really any you know brain learning. If you provide a stimulus to somebody that they don't care for with enough repetition, it really will, even though it's provoking the short term, they'll adapt to it and then it's no longer bothersome. So in the intermediate to advanced phase of this rehab, we actually have people do things like shake their head on purpose, even though it really stimulates their symptoms, sometimes horribly, over time, they just won't get the same symptomatic response. Their brain relearns to say, hey, when that input comes in from the inner ear with me moving my head, I'm gonna have a normal response to that, not this hyper inflammatory response. Same thing, believe it or not, some of the slides we looked at with all of those striped patterns and kids moving, we will view those in therapy and be able to provoke people a little short term, but that provokes their brain to start to get it again, to say, hey, even if I'm in front of this horrible action movie with special effects, I won't get so nauseated. So some specifics on that, somatosensory substitution, uh, we're just really coaching emphasis on being aware of that touch and pressure to control acute symptoms. Um, so if it makes sense, the funny looking guy in the lower left is what they, a representation, what they call a homunculus representation. In our brains, our hands, feet, face, tongues have a lot more sensory perception. There's a lot more area of the brain devoted to perceiving that than other parts of the body. So we try to, we try to coach using this. For example, the athlete on the right, She's balancing with her eyes closed. We take away vision to have her brain pay more attention to the somatic sensation. You could use some modern terms like she's being more mindful of this. So yes, she's doing a balance drill. The therapist would be coaching her to pay attention to exactly where the pressure is under the sole of her foot, say in the Achilles tendon or the tendons around the knee and hip. She's also being coached to push into her pelvis with her hands so she can feel that in the pelvis, but also the pressure in the hand. As the amount of sensory substitution that comes in 
through the somatosensory pathway goes up, she, her brain can use that to substitute for the part that isn't processing well, like the inner ear. Visual substitution, the best way to just cut to this one is spotting has been used uh, for athletes to enhance balance and sensory orientation uh, for years. So if you want a good modern example, if we all watch Sean White win his third gold medal in snowboarding or any of the other events, if you've been watching the Olympics and wondered, why do they put the blue dye on the snow? They're putting the blue dye in the snow so that there's a really clear item that people can spot. It wouldn't make sense for them to put white dye on the snow. There wouldn't be contrast. So they put the blue dye so that those athletes who are tumbling through the air will be able to spot something in the background and help them orient. Now we do the same kind of thing, obviously without the risk of snowboarding, but in the gym, we just try to retrain that ocular motor coordination and you can see in the upper left, uh, one of our therapists, Lindsay, is training. She's holding a laser pointer to have a really easy, so we're just repurposing existing technology of the laser pointer to give her a real easy target. That way the athlete could do that at home, they can do it in our gym. Any wall becomes an opportunity to do that visual targeting, and she's gonna use those, those coordination mechanisms we talked about. Smooth pursuit would be really slow, saccades would be really quick to chase the dot. And the, the better she gets, at finding the target, it would be like, say, a camera person for the news being faster at pointing and focusing and shooting a camera, they're gonna get better pictures. So same way in therapy, if we retrain the coordination of eye movements that enhances visual perception, that eliminates the sensory conflict. That lets the brain say, okay, I'm getting it. If I'm, not, if I'm having trouble reading the information from the inner ear and that doesn't make sense to me, well, as I get better visual spots, hey, now I am oriented. I don't feel as nauseated. I don't feel like I'm moving. I can turn down the aisle at school or I can turn down an aisle way at the supermarket and not get dizzy because they're spotting. So just like the way snowboarders and skiers uh, and ice skaters in the Winter Olympics currently would spot as part of their sports skill set, we teach that skill set in therapy. Uh, a classic example, if you look at the bottom of the slide, is we see a ballerina doing a classic turn. You'll see her body turning through the rotation, but if you notice is each and every picture, she's looking right out of the screen at you. They're doing that. They shot the picture to show how a ballerina without a concussion would use visual spotting as a skill set. We love skill sets in physical therapy because we can teach a skill set even when somebody's injured. This is a painting, I am not cultured enough to tell you the provenance of art history, but it's a fairly uh, famous print or, or sorry, painting that would be on display at an art museum. We could all see that and say, oh, it's, there's some art there. But the way to think of this is like, well, how do we really perceive that? Believe it or not, you probably weren't aware of this watching, but your eye did a number of movements in order to perceive this picture. So the next slide shows a graphing of how ocular motor control moves your eyes. So even though I know we all just said, oh yeah, I see the picture, you don't realize, but those those white lines are a graph to probably something very similar. Right now, as you're listening to me, your eyes probably took a similar path to match up and map that picture. So if you see a white line, that would show when an eye is moving. If you see the scribbles or dots, that's where the eye pauses really briefly to capture the image. And notice, yeah, we do pay more attention to faces. That's a human behavior. But there's a few things, like there's a couple saccades where uh, the viewer would go from, say, the gentleman's face down towards his feet or the black dress of the lady that you map the environment. All this picture shows us is our eyes are moving all the time to map the environment. That would be even more intense if we were looking at a picture of a busy hallway at school, a large big box store like a Walmart or Costco, um, or definitely a sporting event where you are looking to find other players, open receivers, and so on. That's something we do all the time. If the part of your brain that controls ocular motor control is off, you won't map the environment well. You'll have poor visual perception that could trick your brain into thinking you're moving and really affect your balance and other types of coordination, for example, eye-hand. So again, I've got kind of an ugly visual field here. So this is an optical illusion. As you're viewing this, if you guys are just saying, whoa, those discs and circles seem like they're moving, don't worry, everything's fine. It's an optical illusion. You're supposed to think they're moving. It's supposed to look like that. 
If anyone's wondering, this is not an animation, it's just a 2D image, but the quality of the image is designed to trick you in your eyes and moving. Um, what you can do now is try to apply a little bit of rehab here to see if you can do that. So instead of looking at the whole picture, look really intently at one of the black dots in the center of one of the discs. And what you might notice is when you focus your vision on that one, that you might be able to stop the sense of movement. Versus if you look around and move your eyes around the slide, you're going to get that rotary movement. But again, just for an example, try to spot on just one of the black circles in the middle of the discs, and you might be able to freeze it. If you were able to freeze it even briefly, you just applied a skill set we can teach of how to retrain a kid of concussion to point their vision again, but we're able to halt that abnormal sense of movement. So that's an example we could all feel, but we've got to do an awful lot more of that training when this is affected with concussion. Gaze stabilization is just our view saying that uh, we view a target and then we move the head. Um, when people start in therapy, this is very difficult because like you might have felt in our example earlier, as soon as they start moving the head, even slow speeds, and I'd say, wait a minute, that tip of the pen I'm looking at is shaking all over the place and I'm getting really symptomatic. Uh, what's the problem? Well, we'd have to train that sometimes just a minute at a time and gradually build people up. But as they start to pick up speed, as they get, they regain their skill, they're able to focus their eyes on the pen cap better. It no longer jumps out side to side. So again, oscillopsy is just our medical term saying, if the patient with concussion or other types of vertigo moves their head and it looks like the image is shaking all around, we call that oscillopsia. It's a symptom. As people do this training where they look at a stationary target and move their head, they start to control that. It also habituates to just head movement. So meaning is, unfortunately this drill, it's a tough sell for us is as people do this, not only does the image shake, but they'll say, oh, I'm getting sick, I feel dizzy. It's a hard sell, but we try to remind them like, it's okay to keep training, it's gonna get better, just like you trained and maybe we're sore after lifting weights. That was a normal response to training. It's a normal response to this type of training to be briefly a little bit dizzy and nauseated as they keep training, their brain habituates and it doesn't bother them. The carryover is then if uh, they have to do something in their daily life that was bothering them. So it sounds funny, but a routine chore that a lot of kids with concussion might have their parents ask them to do, like do the dishes or cook a meal, even moving in the kitchen for just a, a typical chore, what we call an activity of daily living might be provoking. This drill helps them get back to that. So some things that more people on this call are probably very familiar with what we do uh, with physical therapy is we're always really more known for sort of musculoskeletal anatomy. So many patients around the world that didn't have concussion had neck pain and headaches, maybe from the postures we all have to do as we do more keyboarding and email and they're kind of uh, slaved to our desk. Physical therapists have great research that shows if we do manual therapy, and again, like the picture shows, that just means hands-on treatments to sometimes just physically improve the health of the tissues like tendons and ligaments and muscles, but also to move the joints and improve that lubrication, particularly the upper cervical spine, that can really help for neck pain, movement, and headaches. And we do that not only at the upper cervical spine, uh, but also down into the middle back, the thoracic spine and ribs. Sometimes treatment of joints there that don't move well, even if that's not where the patient hurts. So a lot of our patients that might say, I don't hurt down between my shoulder blades, manipulating or mobilizing a joint there that frees up movement might still improve their headache and overall neck motion. The graphic at the lower right is what we're talking about when we say decompression, de sorry, decompression of the occipital nerves. If you look at that graphic, there's some key nerves that literally perforate and have to shoot right up in between those upper cervical muscles. So what you wanna think about is, say if a high school free safety in football has a hard hit and has enough force to jar their brain inside the skull and get a concussion, they might have all the dizziness we talked about, the nausea, the imbalance. They also might have headaches. A fair percentage of those headaches might be directly from the brain or even the dura lining the brain. And we do a number of things as part of our overall team to manage that. We get them to do an appropriate amount of rest, 
If it was a really bad migraine headache that was purely coming from the brain, they might work with a pediatric neurologist and get some medications to help. But we're finding that for a lot of these kids, a fair portion of their headache, or sometimes the whole reason for the headache, is actually a little more anatomical, a little more mechanical. So if you have, if we go back to that free safety that had enough force to jar the brain and cause a concussion, there's certainly we're finding enough force to jar the joints and the muscles. If that then compresses those nerves, you can see how that would cause not only pain that started at the neck, right by the base of the skull, but then would start to creep up the back of the skull and cranium. So as we massage those muscles, we improve the joints as we get them to better posture, there's less compression on the nerves, there's less of that pain that goes up the skull and we improve their headache. Stabilization training just means there's really actions we do and I've always done to improve the posture, to improve the way the neck muscles keep that efficient posture. We try to tell our concussion patients to think about what your neck joints and muscles and tendons do would essentially be like balancing or juggling the weight of the head, including the brain, up on top of some building blocks. So when we say stabilization, we're trying to not only do a good posture, but have the patient be able to react and keep a good level head position wherever they're at. That's been shown again, control headaches, and it also helps further control the vertigo. Like I said, exertional training uh, always confuses people. In the US, we would just call that doing your aerobics or your cardio. A lot of the studies that will be done, say in Australia, the UK, or particularly Canada, are really high quality. They would call that like physical exertion or exertional training. The main thing we do in physical therapy is the first thing we do and really try to interact with the patient, the parents, and the athletic trainers, sometimes at the schools, would be to pick a mode of training that minimizes the head movement and visual stimulation. So we use this as a good example is the picture here is an open source thing, but it's an advertising piece of a whole series of new treadmills that have uh, this giant wraparound screen and they have matching virtual reality uh, pictures. The idea being is you could be somewhere in the dead of winter in the Midwest, go on a run and still get the visual effect of doing a trail run, say here in the Pacific Northwest. It's a real good upsell. It might make cardio training more fun for all of us, but that'd be a really bad idea for someone who has a concussion and that the jarring of the treadmill moving their head up and down might provoke dizziness as well as a moving visual image on a large screen in front of them that is a purposely built virtual reality device. So it's, in other words, it's an optical illusion. Either one of those in isolation could make the patient with uh, vertigo, I'm uh, sorry, with the patient with concussion, vertigo, nausea, dizziness. That's probably not where you want them to do their aerobic training initially. So usually we put them on a recumbent bike that a lot of kids high school and college age just hate because they find it really boring and maybe not quite as much exercise uh, strenuous as they're used to, but they can minimize head movement. Same thing as we might pick a, a machine at the gym that faces maybe towards a wall or out a window versus onto the main area of the gym where there's a lot of people moving around. So we would try to take into consideration their problems with sensory integration that are provoking their vertigo and other symptoms and, and just kind of acquiesce to that initially, let them get going. Now, as they get better, then we would like to put them on a treadmill where their head's moving, where there's more movement and visual, but we usually have to train their control of vertigo first with some of the other sensory organization techniques we talked about. Then we could put them back into this kind of aerobic training. Otherwise, what we hear all the time is, the person goes out, they try to work out at the gym or just do conditioning with the team and they make it say like, well, we've had a number of softball players say, I won't play softball, but I'll just run with the team for one up and they get halfway around running around the infield and they end up throwing up because they made themselves really sick. It was the jarring of the head and the movement visually of the other uh, softball team members around them. The other thing we're finding more and more is that unfortunately, um, if we had to oversimplify it, the people with concussion that don't do as well, the ones that don't get back to playing their sport and school and everything in the eight to 12 week period, we don't know all the reasons of which people are gonna take longer and have a more protracted rehab, but we sure know a lot more than we used to. One of the big ones is anxiety. So if say a high school athlete suffered from anxiety before they had their concussion, it's now considered a fairly safe bet that that might get heightened or increased. There's also a number of patients that never had any report of anxiety before the concussion, but that's the thought is maybe that their concussion jars the limbic system and that gets 
keyed up so that they have more of that anxiety. Um, it can really get in the way of all parts of rehab, uh, not just concussion, but we deal with this in sports medicine all the time. It wouldn't seem logical that somebody's knee rehab progress, say after an ACL reconstruction surgery, would be slowed down by anxiety, but it actually really makes sense if you think about how anxiety and those fears could make people reluctant to work out or move ahead. We definitely see it in post-concussive rehabilitation. Uh, thankfully, I'm really lucky here in our Eugene concussion management team to be able to work with people like uh, we work with strong behavioral therapy that can help these people do uh, cognitive behavioral therapies and really directly manage their anxiety. Like we said, we're very privileged to work with Seabird that gives education uh, and training to other organizations to let people know this might be part of their uh, concussion rehab. So for example, I'm a physical therapist. It's not in my scope to give behavioral therapy, but I definitely should be reinforcing what behavioral therapies want to do to manage anxiety in a patient with concussion and that that's heightened. What we're finding is the exertional exercise is a great tool to let them manage that anxiety uh, by burning off that stress in plain terms of exercise. So sometimes they'll have us continue with exertional training even after the athlete is able to control their vertigo and doesn't have headaches, but for some supervised exertional in the States here, we would just call it cardio or aerobic conditioning to help them better manage that. Good. So sorry, that last slide there is just some of my contact information. If you're in Eugene or Oregon or the Northwest region, you ever want to visit us, give us a call. You're welcome to call. I know we'll have some time for questions after the presentation, but I always love that uh, interactions. If you ever want to visit our website, any of that. Uh, there's also a QR code, which will become more popular. Again, if you ever want to screen that, that'll, if you shoot a picture of that with your smartphone now, that'll take you to our website, contact info phone. Um, so again, thanks to everyone, particularly for Melissa for organizing this and hope that gave you some insight on in what we do with physical therapy uh, for MTBI, also as concussion rehab. And then I guess I will pass to Melissa and see if there were uh, questions we want to answer or, or things on the detail. Oh, I'm sorry, I almost forgot. If it's okay, then I'll try to real quick, if everyone can still see my screen, just to go back to this. If everyone can still hear me there, I'm just going to play an example of nystagmus. Again, nystagmus is an involuntary eye movement. It's one of the things we look at here with our technologies for diagnosis. But if you see these eyes moving on this example, it also really explains why our patients with MTBI would be seeing the world differently and having some very odd symptoms, especially with visual stimuli. So as you look here at the dark circles of the pupil and the eyelash around them, you notice there's a jerky movement towards the right side of the screen. Now, as we look at this patient, the right side of the screen is their left, but that's nystagmus. That's one of the things we look for in our uh, physical therapy evaluation. And some patients, believe it or not, will be uh, experiencing that quite a bit, even if they're just daily activities. Thanks, that's what I had for all of the presentation slides and examples, but uh, I'll guess now I will pass back to Melissa. Okay, so I don't have any comments or questions in the chat. Um, now is your opportunity to have Kenji's undivided attention to answer any questions or just you know chat about some thoughts you might have. Um, otherwise, um, we're both available via email. If you ask me and I don't know the answer, I will direct it to Kenji and make sure you get the correct answers. Um, I'm gonna give it a second, see if anybody has any questions. I saw we had a couple uh, other PTs online today too. So if any of, of you all have anything to contribute, that would be that would be great. Okay, well, I'm going to stop the recording there. And um, Kenji, thank you so, so very much. I'm going to end it here. And again, if anybody wants um, to record, to watch this, it'll be on the Seabert website. Great. Thanks so much, Melissa. I really appreciate it. And uh, thanks for all the work you do. I can tell everybody on there that uh, if, you, if you don't know what Seabert does already, they do so many things, it's hard to mention but they do a lot of good things in the state of Oregon and really, honestly, the national level. 
to help people uh, recover from this kind of brain injury. So we appreciate it. Thank you.